So here we are at the San Francisco Dharma Collective on our fourth gathering of A Blameless Life. And this evening, we have the opportunity to explore the fourth precept, undertake the training to refrain from false or harmful speech. And most evenings when we've gathered during this series, we've chanted and we might chant later and we might skip it, but we're not chanting right now. I brought this cute little card with me. This is from Thich Nhat Hanh. It is the Five Mindfulness Trainings of Home Village, Community of Engaged Buddhism. And I might read this in a bit, but I'm not gonna read it right now, but I want to let you know that it was here in case anyone wants to look at it because I hadn't offered that yet. So that's important piece of what we're doing here. So we've been exploring the five precepts and the five precepts as their most commonly translated are very simple. I undertake the training to refrain from, and there's all these different things that you refrain from. And I just need to say for myself and as a gift to all of you, the reminder again and again that it's a training. We're cultivating our training, it's a practice. It's not a perfect, it's not a commandment, it's not a, ugh, it's a, oh, it's a training. And in the Plum Village world, we talk about them as mindfulness training. So even a step further away from precept, they're mindfulness trainings. Oh, we're training the mind or we're engaging in these trainings to increase mindfulness. And for me, when I hold it in that way, when I remember, oh, these are some guidelines the Buddha laid out that will help support me to be more mindful. Or get closer to freedom. Then I find it to be encouraging and liberatory. And not something that I can then beat myself up about because, oh, I didn't do it perfectly. Because good luck with that. Like, you're not perfect. You might look perfect sometimes. But you're not perfect can't be. It's not how it works. That's not what it means to be human. It's like you fall down and you get up. You fall down and you get up. I think that lots of people have said this, and I don't know the exact verbiage of the Michael Jordan quote, but there's a great Michael Jordan quote about getting up every time he fell down, like you know, missed so many more baskets than he made, but he made enough baskets, you know, like just it's the keeping at it. So these are trainings. There are a way to engage in practice. And the training that I want to talk about today is the one that I find to be the most difficult. So I think that might be part of why I'm like laying that down again, because this is the training to abstain from heart, from this is the training to abstain from false or harmful speech. And it's not like I go around lying, like that's not how I like to live my life. And yet, like, maybe I exaggerate sometimes, <laughs> you know? It's like, oh my God, it's the best, but it's like, really? Ah. <sighs> And then we say things that hurt someone else sometimes by accident or on purpose because we're mad. You know, we're human. Like this is, this is how it goes. And we can attune to the residue of that experience, to the residual effect. Oh, how did it feel to yell? I am a yeller. How did it feel to yell? I know for me, it doesn't feel good. It never feels good. And this way that I've been practicing lately, which I was offering in the guided meditation, the, these instructions from Sadhu Vitejaniya, which is like, what's actually happening here in this heart, mind, body? How am I relating to the direct experience? I have 
haven't raged in a while. Like, and I mean months. I'm not talking about like a couple of days, which is already progress. <laughs> but like, I haven't. <clears throat> and I know my husband is happy about it, but I am also happy about it. Cause when I lose it at him, it's suffering for him, but it is also suffering for me. It's awful. Whatever happens inside of me that preceded the explosion is suffering and the exploding is suffering and the aftermath of the explosion is suffering. Like the whole thing is a hot mess. And the more I'm cultivating awareness of things as they are internally and externally, like what's actually happening inside of me, being interested in that and curious about it and attuned to it, just, just because I'm actively, intentionally, and you know, I've had the support of being on a lot of retreat this year, doing that, and there is greater and greater continuity of awareness, wisdom is naturally emerging, and there's less reactivity. It's fucking awesome. It's amazing. And like, that's my wish for you. That's my wish for everyone. That's my wish for me. It's like to be less reactive. That's freedom. Cause you know what that shit keeps happening? The motorcycle, the conversation, the person stop, stomping and walking gently upstairs. Like it keeps happening. And if you live in the city, like I do, and maybe all of you do, there's noise all of the time. It's part of an urban environment. And if we're not liking that or know we're in conflict with that, we're suffering. And if instead we're like, oh yeah, I'm feeling agitated. Or for me, oh, I'm scared. There's something inside of me that's scared. And my response to fear is fuck you. And I just go, I just like fist to cuffs in a second because some part inside of me is scared. And there's been less of that less of that reactivity. So that's why I'm doing my best to offer that style of practice these days because it's helping me and supporting me so much, so much closer to sanity more of the time, most of the time lately, in fact. So those are two ways that we can think about right speech. False. harmful. We can also expand it. So the, the translation that we've been practicing with these last weeks is from Mabaya Giri, and it's very simply just false or harmful. I undertake their training to refrain from false or harmful speech. That's how they translate the fourth precept. But another teacher of mine, Bhante Gunaratna, he's in West Virginia, so closer to Noel, not that far from Washington, D.C., which of course is not that far from Baltimore. It's not. He has, well, what? It's not, basically neighbors. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, basically neighbors, basically neighbors. So he, um, Bhante Gunaratna is in Virginia. Sometimes I know the name of the town, I forget right now, but like an hour or two outside of DC. It's a pretty intense place. So I had the opportunity to practice the Bhante Gunaratna for two months. I stayed at that monastery in 2013. And one of the things that Bhante Ji, as he's known by his friends and followers, one of the things that Bhante Ji offers is something called the eight lifetime precepts. So if you've practiced at a monastery in the Theravada tradition, or you've practiced with monastics outside of a monastery, you've had the opportunity to receive the eight precepts or practice with the eight precepts. These eight lifetime precepts from Bhatiji are different <laughs> from that. Those eight precepts include not sleeping on higher luxurious places, not wearing garlands or perfumes, and not eating at inappropriate times. And inappropriate times would be after the sun's zenith. So that's a like different category of things. That's not what we're talking about. These eight lifetime precepts from Bhante Ji, it's the five that we've been exploring now for a few weeks, but he's taking this fourth one, you know, this really, really hard one, and he's made it four. <laughs> so here's his language.
and we've, we've been offering again, because of my roots with Ajahn Chah students of Ajahn Chah, I've been offering a Vaigiri or Amravati translations. I undertake the training to refrain from. And Bhantiji, he uses the language of translation of the Pali. I undertake the training role to abstain from. And so not very different, but <coughs> subtly different. And maybe some language is more supportive for you or your nervous system is more resonant, your heart mind's more resonant with I undertake the training rule to abstain from rather than I undertake the training to refrain from. Whatever works for you is great. But I'll offer these four and I invite you, you know, to tune into your body, to rest into your body, eyes open or closed, whatever feels good for you. For me, often if I close my eyes, it supports a tuning into the body, but that's just like as a support. Ideally, we're eyes open, engaging with the world, and tuning to our bodies. But we take some supports along the way. So, you know, close your eyes if that's supportive for you. And notice how these words land in your own heart, in your own mind, in your own body. I undertake the training rule to abstain from false speech. What's the residue from that sentence? How is there resonance or dissonance? Just kind of checking in. I undertake the training rule to abstain from false speech. Maybe there's a story in the mind. I never lie. That's not me. Or shit, I lie all the time. Like, whatever is happening, noticing it. Or maybe a particular lie arises in the mind that you remember the suffering of or the pain of. Or there's the argument, well, I lied to so-and-so to save them or protect them or so such and such better thing would happen. Like, whatever. Great. Notice it. That's my ask. I undertake the training role to abstain from malicious speech. You know, those digs or that sarcasm, it's subtle, but sometimes there's malice in there. Sometimes maybe there isn't. And maybe you can notice kind of what's underneath that in your own heart, mind, body when your language is more like that. You know, for me, it's some kind of insecurity, some kind of discomfort, some kind of dukkha in my own internal system that's gone unrecognized, that then gets expressed in my own skillful speech. And that's like another piece of why I'm so excited about this practice these days is because I'm noticing more easily, more clearly, what's actually going on inside in my own heart, mind, body. It's not that I haven't been scared or activated or not liking stuff. But with the current awareness of it, there's more space for it. And it's not like coming out at people as much. I'm not nearly as unskillfully. Again, feeling the body, same sentence. I undertake the training role to abstain from malicious speech. So any speech that has kind of malice in it, I guess by definition would be malicious speech. I think slanderous speech goes into this category.
Or maybe you remember when someone spoke maliciously to you and how that feels, how that felt. And there's a knowing in your own heart, mind, body that you don't want to create that feeling for someone else. Tuning into the body and the heart and the gut. I undertake the training role to abstain from harsh speech. Something that I think is quite interesting about harsh speech is that it's often not so much about the content, but about the delivery. Clean your room. Clean your room. Clean your room. Right? It's like that desire for your offspring to clean their room. Like, nothing wrong with that, but how are we delivering it? Is it an ask or a command or an invitation or a suggestion? I was trying to say something to Frank before I was leaving, and he was dancing around the kitchen and doing the dishes with his headphones on. And I'm like, are you listening to me? And he heard, are you listening to me? <laughs> it's like, right? There's so much. And sometimes it's an accurate perception. Sometimes it's not an accurate perception. Like, that's how it happens in the world. And sometimes a tone comes out that we're not really meaning. Like, that's not how we're feeling. Not but like, you know, so tuning in, I undertake the training rule to abstain from harsh speech. Or in the language that I'm more accustomed to, I undertake the training to refrain from harsh speech. And then the fourth way the Bhantiji speaks of this. I undertake the training role to abstain from useless speech. And we all engage in it sometimes, but I know if you're trying to have a conversation with someone and all they've got going on is useless speech, it's not very interesting. <laughs> it's like, really? <laughs> Are you done yet? Ah, oh, I know myself, I get so aggravated. Just like, whatever. And sometimes I have really unskillful responses inside of me. Like, I don't have to say anything. Because none of these precepts, even when you're a monastic, none of them are about what happens inside. They're all about intentional behaviors. It's so much about intention, or sometimes the word is translated as volition. It's not like you're not going to have, it's, the suggestion is not you're not going to have an angry thought again in your life. You don't have the thoughts you're going to have. You know, they're conditioned by your experience, by what you actually do. But as we're paying attention, we become more skillful. Just by paying attention, by being interested and curious. And in the internal domain, how are you speaking to yourself? Is there false or harmful speech that you're kind of speaking to yourself inside your head, inside your heart, inside your gut? Some kind of negative self-talk, perhaps? They're all lies. They're all lies. But we forget, that's delusion. These views and beliefs, right? that's delusion. Thank you, Andrea Fella, for helping me understand that that's delusion. When we're caught in a view or a belief, we're caught in delusion. And that's the way that we can see it or recognize it, right? Greed and aversion, they're really easy to recognize. We miss them all the time, of course, but they're clearer to understand what they are. But delusion, we believe it. So we don't recognize that we're deluded. It's very sneaky. And you can practice through notice. Oh, I'm holding a belief. There's a fixed view here. Oh, that's delusion, like right there? No way. 
but it's freeing because then we can soften, like the edges of can soften. Like we can recognize, oh, I have this belief. There's some conditioned experience for me such that I believe this. And it's not the only perspective. And all those other perspectives, I don't have to believe them. I don't have to agree with them. But I can respect that, that they can have their perspective. As long as they're not trying to tell me what to do. That's where my life is. Okay, great. And cultivating our ability to speak kindly to ourselves. Like we can move beyond not harsh and practice to speak kindly to ourselves and to recognize when the negative self-talk is there. You can't do anything right or whatever your flavor is. To recognize, oh, that's delusion. <clears throat> that's a conditioned experience. That's not me. That's not mine. I'm not thinking that thought. There's no self here. Whatever some collection of conditions are sufficient such that that thought has arisen. All right. And the scene of it, like the actual scene of it, can release it, can put it down. And then maybe we have a skillful thought arise, like, I love you, or this is pleasant, without the greed. It's like, oh, but you just feel that. Like the laughter at a dukkha sit, like, ha, ah, that's nice. It's pleasant, it's light. Like, oh, that has arisen. Okay. And we're not chasing after that either, because of course it's the chasing or the pushing away, or not seeing of the dukkha, or excuse me, not seeing of the delusion that creates dukkha, right? So the chasing after or the pushing away or the not seeing of the delusion, that's what creates dukkha. Greed, aversion, delusion, they're all going to come and go, no problem. When we see them, they lead to freedom. And so I feel like this internal, how we're speaking to ourselves internally, when it's something harsh, like you're a piece of shit or whatever your language for that is. And I want to name that. I'm talking about that. And I want to name that that is a universal experience. I think that often when we're feeling shitty about ourselves, we can think that like we're terminally unique, right? Like that's our particular thing to feel so shitty. But everyone experiences it sometimes. And that normalizing of it can be really helpful. It's like, oh, we might have our own different flavor of it, but it's a universal human experience to feel that sometimes. Some of us might feel it more than others. I don't know. I only know my own direct experience and the people that I support, students I've worked with, but it's like, yeah, totally normal to feel that. And it's a lie. <clears throat> And it's harsh. It's both a lie and harsh. It's got two of these going on in it. And it's totally useless, right? I think that some of us, I know for me anyway, part of the conditioning of that, it's coming from something inside of me. It's like trying to help me or trying to save me. It's like, wow, that is a maladaptive coping strategy. But when there was constant critique, there was a part inside that was born, like, well, I'm gonna get in there first. <laughs> like somehow like protecting me from it. Or uh, people pleasing that arose, we want to try to make sure everyone else is happy so that I'll be safe. And then it's like just complete neglect and all the energy is out there. That's not skillful, but it's conditioned. And you have your own experience, or so you didn't grow up where I grew up, you grew up where you grew up, and there's conditioning, and it arises. And we can remember, oh, it's just conditioned. It's not me. And our relationship to it, that's where the freedom comes in. It's like, oh yeah, okay, this is what's happening not trying to change it or fix it or like 
take on this big self-improvement project. It's like, yeah, this is conditioned. Okay, hi. And maybe compassion arises. Maybe it sucks us in and we're like, oh, maybe don't get too close to that. And then some metta or some compassion is supportive or a walk or a swim or a surf or something that's nourishing. Nice drink of water, a meal, phone a friend, like other things. Sometimes we really need to consciously change the channel. And I invite you to explore this fourth precept about this. I invite you to explore this fourth precept as an investigation of the internal language of this language that we're speaking to ourselves. As you're able to with curiosity and gentleness and softness, and noticing how it feels in the body when the conditions are sufficient, such that some of that is up. Like, oh yeah, oh, that's what's up. And maybe asking the question of, what do I need? Or how can I care for myself in this moment? I love that turn of phrase that was offered to me by Gil Franzdell in retreat some years ago now. And I'm sure that the words have changed in my own mind, but what I have heard him say who knows what it was originally is, how can I be kind to myself in this moment? Like what a mantra. Like what if we lived ourselves with that mantra? Because when we're kind to ourselves, we're kind to others. And when we're kind, there's no false or harmful speech coming out of our mouths or being generated in our hearts. That's not what's happening. So taking a moment to Notice how these words are landing in your heart, own heart, mind, body, resonance, dissonance. If anything I've offered is supportive for you, please practice with it. If you're inspired to share it with someone else, go to town. If anything that I've said is not supportive for you, let it go, leave it here, throw it out. It's not the Dhamma, it's just my own unskillfulness because I'm a human being. And notice as you practice what's forward leading for you and trust that, trust your own inner guide. And if you're up for the challenge, I invite you to spend this week playing with this fourth precept. I undertake the training to refrain from false or harmful speech. Or you might explore it in a, this way I've just been talking about to notice how it feels once you've engaged in har harmful or false speech. Like, oh, there it was. And then you feel how that feels in your own heart, mind, body. Or for like the advanced course, noticing how it feels in the body before it comes out. Like, mm. what is that Ugh, in there that then ends up getting expressed in this way that you know doesn't feel so good. So play with your practice. And any benefit that might have been generated by us gathered in this way and exploring the Dhamma and cultivating awareness of our own heart, minds, and bodies may it ripple out through everyone we come in contact with, and thereby be a benefit to all beings. May the fruits of our practice be a benefit to all and bring peace and liberation. Thank you so much for your practice, for this opportunity to be here to share the Dhamma together and share the practice of meditation. Your presence is a gift to everyone else who's here live and online. Your presence is a gift to me and to the collective, keeps this place warm. And if you have time, energy or money to contribute, this is a completely donation volunteer run entity. So that is very appreciated. 
And if your finances allow you to help with the rent and the lights and those types of things, that is quite welcome. And any monies you give for this evening or for this course are split 50-50 between the collective and me. And so it helps me to pay my rent and my grocery bill and things like that. And it's much appreciated and not expected or required. This is, this is an offering. This is a gift, so any gift you can offer in return is great. And whatever works for your own heart, mind, body, and, and pocketbook.